Hi, good morning, um, and uh, welcome to our uh, symposium on myelopathy. And, um, you know, we just uh, uh, heard a, a number of uh, papers on patients, you know, presenting with deformity, frailty, very, you know, kind of severe presentation of cervical disorders. We're going to uh, switch gears and talk about patients who actually have much milder uh, issues, but sometimes the imaging looks kind of scary but their clinical presentation is kind of mild. And, you know, this is a dilemma. What do, what do we do with these, um, what do we do with these uh, patients? And so I'm going to um, ask uh, Dr. Jeff Wong, who's also co-moderating this session with me, to kind of present a case to just kind of uh, uh, set us up for some of the subsequent discussions. So I'm going to present a case that I think we've all seen in, in the office. Um, these are my disclosures, which is not going to affect anything I'm going to talk about. So this is a 68-year-old female who, interestingly enough, has a past medical history of a prior caught equina and had some type of decompression done in an outside hospital. But she pre presents to me with really no progressive gait issues, no change in bowel bladder. She really just has some mild numbness in her hands. It's kind of diffuse, doesn't really follow any radicular pattern. She has uh, some mild diffuse radicular symptoms that kind of vaguely go down her arms into her hands. And she is on exam floridly myelopathic. She's got hyperactive reflexes. She's got every reflex she tests is at least three plus or higher. She has uh, Hoffman's reflexes bilaterally, but really no gait disturbances. And uh, on her x-rays, she has just some degenerative changes. Uh, she can still move a little bit. And on the MRI, she's got profound cord compression with cord signal change. And she's a slightly kyphotic, which is um, kind of centered right at the area of the tightest compression. When you look at the uh, cross-section at C3-4, you can see that it's uh, mildly stenotic. But when you look at the area that's most compressed, you can see that it's very, very much compressed and has real cord signal changes in myelomalacia. So the real question in this patient is what to do for this patient. Uh, she's obviously, we've all seen this, they've come into the office and they're seeing you for a second opinion and they said, someone told me I was gonna be paralyzed if I don't have surgery. And so what do we do with this patient? I think that kind of centers around this symposium up next uh, to present kind of the, you know, the, the argument for when you might pursue non-operative approaches will be uh, Jeff Wilson um, at the, from the University of Toronto. So thank you very much. Um, just to start off with disclosures, I think we should all kind of acknowledge that as cervical spine surgeons, we're all slightly conflicted insofar as we get paid to operate on people's necks. Michael and I are a little less conflicted because we get paid in Canadian dollars, but nonetheless, a conflict that still does exist. Um, so I think we're all familiar with this, that there is a spectrum of disease, and patients range from severely impacted to, to minimally impaired. And I think with the increased ubiquity and accessibility of neuroimaging, we're increasingly seeing patients on the mild side of things with canal stenosis, mild symptoms. In fact, um, some image, neuroimaging studies would suggest that the lifetime incidence of cervical stenosis is around 24%, and of course, not all of these patients will become myelopathic, but a proportion of them will develop neurologic symptoms and end up in a spine surgery clinic near you. So there's a strong imperative to, I think, develop a deeper understanding of how to optimally manage these patients. And I think there are certain unique considerations for this group. The first and most glaring is that they're mild, so they harbor less disability. Many of them are very functional and active. Some of them are working, supporting families. So it's a higher stakes game, both from an operative and non-operative perspective. The other key thing is that in contrast to, say, treatment of cervical radiculopathy or in the lumbar spine, neurogenic claudication or radicular symptoms, where the treatment goal is amelioration of symptoms, in the context of mild myelopathy, the primary goal is functional preservation. So averting future deterioration, whether it's progression of myelopathy or spinal cord injury. So if we're in order to meaningfully counsel these patients, we better have a pretty good understanding of what the incidence or rate of these sort of deterioration events are. So just to kind of frame the conundrum, I think, um, this is a patient of, of my own. So it was a 45-year-old professional, had some stable numbness in his hand for about a year, had an MRI which showed two-level cord compression. He had a Hoffman on, on one side, mild myelopathy. He was um, uh, offered surgery at another hospital. He came for a second opinion. And patient is very ambivalent and anxious about going ahead with surgery, just started a new firm, he has young kids, and he asks, doc, can surgery wait? I think when we're talking about non-operative management, it's, you have to, we have to be very clear about 
what we mean by that and what we don't mean by that. So non-operative management does not mean no surgery ever. We don't say, sorry, sir, you're not a candidate for surgery and ride off into the sunset. That's not what we mean. What we do mean is that no surgery now with counseling, education, close follow-up, and obviously surgery if deterioration occurs. So when you posed your, your case, I didn't put my hand up to offer surgery. And that doesn't mean that I would never operate on that patient. Of course I would. But I think in that context, when patient is doing quite well, functional and active, why not start with observation and see how they do? So when framed through that lens, I think most of us can agree that starting with this non-operative approach is very reasonable and tenable. And when we look at the um, arguments for and against, I think the crux of this with respect to evidence is what is the natural history without surgery? We looked at this when we were putting together the um, guidelines for cervical myelopathy management a few years back. The evidence in general is quite poor. The, as Dr. Failings alluded to, 20 to 62 percent of patients will deteriorate over a three to six year period. It's kind of imprecise, not very useful. This wasn't just looking at mild patients, it was looking at all patients of, of different severities. So that's kind of home in a little bit on specific studies that look at mild patients. And I think some of the best evidence available is now somewhat old, but still uh, remains very true to this day. So this is Kadanka's series of studies. He actually took patients with milder myelopathy, 68 of them, and randomized them to operative versus non-operative care. And at three years, not only did the patients who didn't have surgery remain stable, there was actually a trend to improve, improved functional outcomes amongst those who had non-operative care as compared to operative care. And then he continued to follow this group up to 10 years. Of course, there were some patients lost to follow-up, but the results remained stable. That is, patients treated non-operatively on average did not deteriorate, and in fact, there's a continued trend towards improved outcomes in those who did not have surgery. This is another older study in Japan, it looked at 63 patients with uh, myelopathy treated non-operatively, some, um, some of whom were mild. Only 3% deteriorated, and in fact, mild initial symptoms was a, a, a positive predictor of successful treatment with non-operative care. This is an, a more recent study given, uh, written by Dr. Martin, who's a panelist here today. And 117 patients followed over time. Um, and interestingly, in this study, they moved beyond MJOA. So they looked at more granular assessment of outcomes, including hand function, walking, balance, and they found a greater risk of deterioration over time. In fact, 57 deteriorated, 57% deteriorated over time, suggesting that it really depends on what we measure, that things like grip strength, dexterity are more sensitive for capturing change. Patients may get worse, but what I found particularly illuminating in this uh, paper was that if you looked at how they deteriorated, only one patient experienced a very sudden, severe drop in, in their neurologic function, suggesting that in the context of a uh, system where you can closely watch, monitor, counsel these patients, we should be able to recognize and intervene in the cases of, uh, with surgery in the cases of deterioration and, and avert any significant disability from developing. So a proportion of patients will get worse, of course, it depends what you measure, but sudden development of severe disability is rare. We also get worried about uh, spinal cord injury if patients, for instance, fall and have a trauma. Fortunately, the evidence shows that that's not really an issue. So this is a great study by Langs and Hawley's group, 55 patients with significant canal uh, stenosis, mild symptoms. Uh, Ten of these actually had a trauma during follow-up and no patients experienced a significant spinal cord injury. This is a similar patient in pre-symptomatic patients with um, non-myelopathic patients with severe stenosis. Again, 14 uh, patients had significant trauma during the follow-up, and none of them had a very severe or catastrophic spinal cord injury. At a population level, this uh, study is often quoted. It's from Taiwan, and it looked at and it showed that patients who were admitted to hospital who had surgery experienced a lower chance of subsequent spinal cord injury as compared to those who were admitted to hospital with myelopathy who did not have surgery. But this isn't really relevant for mild myelopathy because Let's face it, patients with mild myelopathy would never be admitted to the hospital, so it's not generalizable to the mild group. We've seen a lot of studies that have shown that surgery can be performed safely and effectively in patients with mild cervical myelopathy, but I think it's important to remember that most of these studies are uncontrolled. There's no basis for comparison. So all the, although the patients do quite well, we're not really comparing them to anything, especially we're not comparing them to patients who had this non-operative watchful waiting approach. And so we can't use these studies to justify operative intervention in all people with mild DCM. And in fact, we know that surgery usually goes well, but it isn't innocuous sometimes. We know that the risk of complications is about 15 to 20 percent, with about a third of these being serious or severe. So we can't minimize that either. So in conclusion, 
Non-operative care does not mean that we will never operate on the patient. It means that it is initially reasonable to closely observe, educate, monitor patients for signs of deterioration. And in this context, it's unlikely to have a patient that experiences a very severe, dramatic uh, downturn or, or disability. It is true, though, however, that if you are monitoring patients in this context, surgery should be recommended for patients who are, who are deteriorating. Thank you very much for your attention. So uh, to come back to the case, uh, we'll have our co-moderator, Dr. Wong, uh, present uh, uh, the scenario. Okay, so I changed this last night. So this is the real story on this patient. This patient is 100% asymptomatic. She has no gait disturbance, has no numbness, no radicular symptoms. She is 100% asymptomatic. She has no neck pain, okay? Um, on her exam, she's not hyperreflexic. She has a mildly positive Hoffman's on both sides, and that's it. So I want to retake the vote. Remember, completely asymptomatic, and it's very, very tight. There's cord signal change. How many people would strongly recommend surgery if this were your patient? Okay, how many people would not recommend surgery and just re recommend observation? Okay, it's food for thought. I changed it last night because this is a symposium on myelopathy. I wanted to make sure she was myelopathic. But with that, thank you very much. I, th I think, uh, you know, I think Jeff's case highlights the fact that, you know, you know, the imaging is really helpful, but it's also kind of the clinical scenario. And I think, you know, with the case that, that Jeff highlighted as, 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 um, as uh, Jeff Wilson, you know, has indicated, Initial non-operative management doesn't necessarily mean the patient's not going to require surgery. I, I mean, you know, I mean that's a pretty scary-looking uh, MR. So, JJ, you had a yeah. comment, and then uh, we'll go to the floor. Just a quick comment, and I want uh, Jefferson to actually comment on that. I had the exact same patient that Jeff presented with, and a patient presented uh, to another physician, and the physician told him, told her, either you have the operation, you're going to go paralyzed if you fall or do something, and it's. Not the first time, I'm sure many of you have seen the same scenario, where you see somebody with minimal symptoms just like this, and then they're told they're going to go paralyzed if they don't have an operation. So Jefferson, can you address that? Because I saw a couple of papers that you had um, that kind of addressed the trauma situation. Yeah, I mean, we hear this a lot. And I, I don't think that the doctor that told them that is, you know, um, lying or acting in bad faith. And, you know, there, there is some concern. Uh, the studies suggest that the risk is low, um, but, you know, we have to counterbalance that with our clinical experiences that we see patients coming in with, you know, narrow spinal canals and central cord syndrome, syndrome all the time. And presumably those patients may have had some mild symptoms before the fall. So I don't think we can say the risk is zero. I just don't think that we can say that um, surgery is justified in those patients to obviate the chance of a spinal cord injury down the road. Uh, from the floor. Michael. Uh, Michael Gerling from New York. Um, I think this is an awesome symposium <clears throat> because, uh, I mean, obviously that this is one of the difficult decisions we all face. A lot of these decisions are straightforward uh, with more moderate and severe disease. Um, but to, a comment and then a question. First of all, I, I was impressed Michael, um, that you uh, that you seem to feel that the SF uh, 36 is helpful to you, because in my population in New York City, I feel like they have so many other things whenever they present to me that would confound the results of an SF 36. And I mean, maybe to track them over time. And if they say, well, everything else has not changed, and then you're trying to follow them over time, I could see that, but. I just don't, I just feel like it's so abstract and I'm, so I appreciate the fact that you're, we're looking for other more sensitive tools to try and follow these patients and sort of tease out which ones would benefit more from surgery. Um, but the question I have, and Jeff Wilson in particular, um, a great talk, um, some of my patients have had numbness in their hand for a month and then some of them have had numbness in their hands for eight months. So. The one for one month, if I follow them for six months, they're still not at the eight-month point. You know, so how long do you think it's reasonable to follow a person that has numbness in their hand? I mean, I don't want to have numbness in my hand, and it distracts me, especially if it's my dominant hand. Um, so these symptoms may seem mild in the big picture of things, but they do seem like they're very distracting and disturbing to people. And um, and then in in the context of the fact that you're waiting for things to progress 
or get worse. And they, you know, what do you tell your patients that that have this mild numbness in their hand? They've had it for six months, and you know the statistic that about half of them over the course of three to six years are going to get worse. Do you tell them? Do you tell them that well, if you get worse and I do surgery on you? You're going to go back to where you would be if I did your surgery today, or like, how do you counsel them in that regard? Yeah, it's a difficult scenario. I think um, the conversation is different for different patients. I mean, and all is to say, like, I don't think operating on any of these patients is wrong. Like, I think it's 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 a valid option. Um, so if somebody comes with numbness in their hands and and you know it's mild objectively, but it's bothersome to them, I think it's very reasonable to operate. I don't think we can say with certainty that that numbness is definitely going to get better. The evidence does suggest that probably they will have some improvement in the symptoms, but likely not complete resolution. Some of them do. But, you know, if you have that same situation in, say, a seven-year-old and they have numbness in the hand and it's been stable for a year, even if it's been stable for six months, I don't think it's wrong to watch and wait and see how things go. It really, it's an individualized conversation for each person. I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all advice for, for what you're asking. Um, I think, though, that the thing that concerns me a lot is when somebody comes in and says they had numbness in their thumb three months ago, and now two months ago they have numbness in their whole hand, and now the numbness is proceeding up, up the arm. And even though they're an MJOA 16, 17, that pattern of progression worries me, and I would recommend surgery for that person. So it's more so the progression of things over time rather than the symptoms in isolation. Yeah, and I think that, you know, the key, and, you know, I take what y your point, you know, with regard to the limitations of PROMs that people have got a lot of other comor comorbidities, like, that's fair enough. But, you know, say with the case that you're talking about, I, I mean, I think the point is, is that to one person, it, you know, they, they may, it might not matter that they're handsome. To somebody else, it might matter a lot. And you can ask them, <clears throat> how concerned are you about it? And I think if the patient is really concerned, and I think if, you know, they feel that's limiting them, then I, I, I think that's a, that is a very reasonable, you know, option to proceed with surgery. So that's why it's kind of getting out with individualizing the treatment. And, you know, I'm not here to sell the SF36. Obviously, all problems have got their limitations, you know. Yeah. Etc. Da uh, David, but I'm, I'm sorry. Just before you go on, though, but, but just the most important thing about the answer for me is what do you tell them about if they do get worse, whether or not they will have subsequent resolution with surgery? In other words, what is their, that's that was the most important thing I wanted to get to is what is their prognosis if they get worse? You know, with surgery thereafter. Okay, maybe a brief, a brief, brief response, Jeff. Yeah, I, I don't think we know for sure. I think that some people will get back to where they're better than they were before. Some people will be normal, but some won't. So I don't think we can state in absolute terms with respect to that question. Some may get better, some may not. And it's hard to predict, you know, where they'll fall on that continuum. On average, 70% of patients uh, will report that the improvements meet kind of what they ter determine to be functionally significant. Okay, so not everybody, but the majority. And, and there are also studies that show that your um, patient satisfaction with their outcomes are different or worse if the symptoms have progressed before they had surgery. So that's another concern. Anyway, just a comment. Okay. I think just one other point, though, is, you know, we know even, you know, a lot of patients with mild myelopathy and surgery do well, but we also know about 30% of them don't do well with surgery. Yep. That, you know, they have neck pain, you know, impaired quality of life. So you have to counterbalance the argument with that. Just because we do surgery doesn't mean you're going to do great, which is another point. All right. Uh, I think we should move on. Okay. David Chan, Hong Kong. Hi. Um, yeah, thank you. It's a great symposium. Um, I want to, um, it's interesting to see um, JOA was not mentioned in the assessment panel because for mild, um, myopathy, especially like in Japan or Korea or in Hong Kong, we are still using the JOA score. And it's uh, very sensitive in picking up those patients with um, like continuous, like once they can't use the chopsticks or like bundling and they start using the spoon or the forks, then we know uh, uh, this is like just very sensitive in picking up um, those group of patients. So like I know this like C-spine um, research society, like do you think uh, in the long run, uh, JOA is still part of the assessment panel? Uh, do you want to maybe comment, JJ, and then Alan? Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I did mention it in my talk, uh, just 
brought up the uh, MJOA. I think it has a clearly um, indication uh, for patients with myelopathy and support its use. I think in milder forms, it may have limitations. In moderate to severe, its application is better. But yeah, uh, as I presented, yes, it's, it's a valuable tool. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, okay, question over here. Yes, Fred Harrington from uh, New York. I just have an observation. I've had a few patients over the years who present with an anterior spinal artery type syndrome without trauma. And what that suggests to me that maybe the, the vascular hypothesis here is something we maybe should spend a little more time on. Should we develop some blood flow uh, measurement, some quantitative blood flow measurement uh, type of technology for this problem? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, there's a number of groups that have done that already. Um, I think Langston Hawley's group at UCLA has, has done a study on that using uh, dy dynamic contrast enhanced MRI to look at perfusion of the cord and, and look at perfusion deficits. I know I was trying to get that going. We were also looking, there's a couple PET <laughs> studies that look at perfusion and metabolism. Um, but the work's early and, and more needs to be done for sure. It, there likely is, is a, uh, you know, a hypoperfusion effect in some patients, but not all patients. There's also dynamic trauma and other factors. So, um, but I think it's it's an important consideration that hasn't been really worked out yet. The other the other part of the vascular piece is also the venous side in the the blood spinal cord barrier because, mm -hmm. um, you know, we 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 probably should be thinking a bit more about you know chronic disruption of blood spinal cord barrier because some of the inflammatory consequences of that might increase risk, for example, de delay C5 palsy yeah. and the, those sorts of issues. I'm actually reviewing a paper right now on yeah. disruption of blood, blood yeah. spinal cord. Very good. Uh, question over here. Yeah. Yeah. Mohamed Mackey, I'm uh, one of the spine fellows at UCSF. A question for Dr. Failings. You had said that patients who have uh, cervical spondylitic myelopathy do better with anterior approaches rather than posterior approaches. Are you speaking from anecdotal experience or from literature? And, and the second question was, um, you mentioned about pain. Um, is there any evidence to suggest that they do better from a, a myelopathy standpoint, or is it just from uh, the pain? Thank you. Yeah, so, so it wasn't for all comers with degenerative cervical myelopathy, because for all comers, the evidence would kind of indicate that there's relative equipoise between anterior and posterior. So our, our studies, um, you know, those. Uh, trial recently. I was talking more about the mild myelopathy work, and and yeah. So the evidence I, I very briefly presented, you know, um, you know, one of the papers using using a machine learning uh, a, a approach and looking at the way patients cluster. In the mild myelopathy patients, a lot the big driver uh, often for surgery is pain, and they do appear to do better with the anterior approaches. And Jeff, if I'm not mistaken, I think you may have. Something uh, similar to that that you're um, working on. Maybe maybe I'm maybe I'm thinking about some of our work that you're co-author on. Yeah. Yeah, and no, I th I think I mean, that actually it's a poster here. Uh, it looks at the combined AO data and specifically mild myelopathy, looking at trajectories of yeah. uh, uh, outcome over time. And again, about 30 percent have a, a, after surgery with mild myelopathy have a, a negative trajectory. Like they get worse over time. And some of the predictors, one of the predictors of that was actually posterior surgery. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, so just as a pearl, okay? So <clears throat> the evidence is emerging there with mild myelopathy. Okay, uh, Jim, Jim Harrop, our president. Yeah, Jim Harrop from Philadelphia. Uh, love the symposium. Real quick comment, and Dr. Moses' head might pop off when I say this, but I'll say it. <laughs> Watching myelopathy papers for a long time, and I follow a lot of patients non-operatively, the neurologic exam is not static meaning that you'll see a patient one day and you'll get an exam three months later and it'll be a different exam and it might be improved. I guess one, I want you to comment on that. And two, most importantly to me is, how do you follow these patients? Because I usually don't see them for six months and I have my own scenario what I tell them, but what do you guys tell them to look out for? Who wants to handle that one? True or false, Dr. Moses. Uh, JJ? Please. Well, I, I'll, that's a really good question, but if I see yeah, the mild ones, I, I think moderate and severe, pretty much you know. Um, I will see them every three months for the first year. Um, and I will follow them uh, depending on how they do. Uh, after that, I may lengthen that. But I follow them every three months. I can just, 
Yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, yeah. Al. Yep. So, uh, Alan Martin at UC Davis. Uh, I'm running a prospective study where we're following these patients every six months and doing like a one-hour-long comprehensive assessment and trying to figure out what's relevant to, to follow. Um, there's a, a number of muscle groups that we think deteriorate slowly, like hand grip, and we published that previously. So grip dynamometer is a good way to follow these patients. Hand intrinsics slowly get subtly worse. Um, you know, their reflexes do change over time. Uh, their gait is really important, so we're coming up with a measure that doesn't require the expensive equipment to try to watch their gait over time, tandem, and actually score it, um, but it's difficult. So. Uh, that, I don't think everyone can spend an hour on each of these patients, but we're trying to come up with a five or ten minute exam that, that can do that. So. Very good. Uh, question you. over here. Sure. Damon Marr from the University of Kansas Medical Center and also of note recently completed time at the Texas Back Institute. Uh, Mike, this has been a phenomenal session. It's very informative. Uh, I had a comment for the diagnostic tools talk. Um, we appreciate the shout out. Um, Lieberman definitely appreciates uh, his uh, views being shared. Um, and I kind of want to um, hopefully just share a comment of optimism that we're actively working on several, you know, approaches to improving the ability to make objective measures available to like the daily practice. And honestly, the, the ability of your, what we carry in our pockets with our phones now is more than enough to achieve a lot of the metrics that we've already been working on. And a lot of this really has to do with refining our understanding of you know, things like balance characteristics during sway, like or sway characteristics during balance, and with things like simplified gait assessments. And so the, the, the bar to entry is much lower than it, it, it used to be, and it's, you know, quite accessible at this point. So just uh, appreciate that. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I mean, the, uh, you know, th there's a lot of interest in potential smartphone applications to, you know, kind of assess movement and gait and so on. Okay, so uh, very briefly, uh, two, uh, Two last uh, kind of brief questions or comments. Yeah, I, uh, Bob Hart from Seattle. I, uh, mine is a comment, and I'll keep it very brief. Um, you know, I, I'm sitting here doing the math, and I realized that the first time I attended this meeting was now 25 years ago when I was a fellow, and that math uh, staggers me. But the, the conclusion I want to bring out of it is I think nearly every year we have this debate. And uh, nearly every year, the conclusions are pretty much still the same as they were 25 <laughs> years ago. And the vote, the vote on the cases is also pretty close to 50-50 every year. So I wanted to submit this topic as the operative definition of clinical equipoise. And with that, I'll turn the microphone over to Dr. Moses. <clears throat> Dr. Moses. Very quickly, uh, regarding <clears throat> the gentleman who described a patient with numbness in a hand. If you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Just because they're seeing an orthopedic surgeon doesn't mean that the surgeon understands why the patient has a numb hand. It could be a carpal tunnel syndrome, a cubital tunnel syndrome, an asymmetric neuropathy. It could be either cord compression or root compression. That's right. <laughs> You really have to work with a neurologist to define what you're dealing with. Assuming you get the correct answer and you do relieve the cause of the numbness, it may never go away because you may have irreparable cord, root, or peripheral nerve compression. But the comment, you have to understand what the patient asks, is asking you to do. Can he or she live with it? It could even be cerebral for that matter. Um, I really think a very careful neurological examination is important. Last but not least, you can't manage a patient based on statistics. The patient you're, you may be seeing may be the one outlier with 99 others who are not the same. So you really have to define the problem before you can describe the treatment of it, if anything. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Moses. Points well taken, careful exam, and individualizing patient management for sure. So very brief uh, final comment uh, from uh, Dr. Anderson. Thank you, Paul Anderson from Madison. Uh, one uh, clinical aid that was not mentioned is asking about falls. I have a special interest in osteoporosis, and uh, orthopedic surgeons, neurosurgeons do not ask this question enough. Forty percent of people over the age of 65 before they have spine surgery have a fall, 40% after they have spine surgery have a fall. 
and, and I think we need to include fall assessment as part of this pre-op paradigm, especially in a myelopathic, because obviously risk factors are much higher. Yeah, thank you. Point well taken. So I'm going to close out the symposium, and uh, we can have further discussions over coffee. Thanks uh, to everyone. Good job.